It's time for the The Douglas Douglas Coleman Coleman Show. Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome back to the Douglas Coleman Show, Jake Brown. Hi, Jake. How are you? Oh, I'm good, Doug. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for coming back. I looked it up uh, just before we got on, and you were on in August 2020 was the last yeah. time. So it's been almost three years, yeah? And August 2020 was when we started the video show. So I don't think it was really up and running when you were on the audio podcast the last time. But now it's been up. Uh, we've got 578 shows produced in the last That's fantastic. two and a half years. And uh, so we'll, we'll get you on. No, no worries. We'll get you on maybe in May or something. But um, thank you for coming back. It's nice to have you here. I wanted to ask you right off the bat, sure. uh, what exactly are you promoting, if anything? Because last time you were on, we talked about your book, Behind the Boards which was the music book, and we got into a conversation about uh, Anne and Nancy Wilson and and various other musicians. But uh, I see all this TV work you're doing now. Were you doing that work at that time, or is this No, actually, well, I've been a talking head on things. I've been fortunate, um, and, and, you know, I did the 2018 Death Row Chronicles for BET, and then I did this wonderful show called music's greatest mysteries just in the last couple of years, I've been a cast member of and breaking the band. I do a couple of those here and there, but what happened is in 2020, uh, over the course of the zoom, um, summer 50th book campaign, um, I was amazed by the technology and I started, uh, basically trying to adapt what I do within the music anthologies and comp, you know, uh, books where I do the series of interviewing and profiling musicians, songwriters, producers, etc. I decided to try to flip that script and reinvent a little bit, which is just something that that COVID demanded of any author that wanted to sort of stay on the radar. Um, and that, you know, it was amazing. I thought, okay, well, I would love to do a show where I profiled authors. That it's not a podcast. I have such respect for y'all who are innovators in the podcast universe, but I was noticing in the streaming television space, there was nothing going on of any kind uh, involving interviewing authors, and it blew my mind. And so um, I thought, okay, what about we do a show about the author? And then all of a sudden, it went about the author's TV. And the show was born uh, out of me just personally emailing Brad Meltzer and Sumon Kidd and uh, different authors of, of the highest echelon I could think of that I had been reading and had been fans of for years and um, others. And uh, it just started exploding in terms of the number of replies I got. Um, we built a set here in Hendersonville, uh, in Nashville, and it's a lockout set and it cost me a small fortune. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I started investing pretty much all of my time in it and interviewing authors, um, in episodic profiles. So we start with how they discovered reading and writing, um, how they fall in love with storytelling, foot in the door in the book business. And kind of like I do with the music biographies, we chronicle the behind the scenes making of their books, uh, from the character creation to, you know, the, the, just the whole arcs of the series and different advice for different aspects of creating fiction, nonfiction. It basically covers all genres and generations. And so uh, a streaming network, um, we started pitching it in 2021, and 2BTV picked it up, um, which is one of the top five streaming networks. You have Hulu, crack, uh, Hulu Amazon, Netflix, Pluto, 2B, um, there's, there's six or seven of them. And That was the first 54 episodes there. We had some amazing um, authors, and we do a whole... It's an episodic show, so I do an intro, uh, and then I ask questions, and basically we shoot it over Zoom, and then we edit everything together when I re-ask my host clips. We use graphics. We uh, just really show like you a whole history. And so it really has... I mean, over 700 authors in uh, two and a half years, and seasons three and four are going to be airing in a couple weeks with 68 more new episodes. Um, and they're just like, uh, I, you know, the names I could off my head, give you a bunch of names that, that are just amazing from them. Like Kim Stanley Robinson, Joyce Carol Oates. Um, we have bones creator, Kathy Reichs. We have just, just the whole echelon of, of authors up and down the line from every genre. Um, Dean Kuntz, um, Riley Sager, uh, God, Longmire creator, uh, Craig Johnson, it just goes on and on and on. And, uh, the object was, 
is hopefully to continue to build it out um, so it, you know, basically continues to expand. And we have about 2 million viewers and counting uh, every day. We, we add new uh, numbers both from the streaming and from the YouTube channel. And uh, it really has just become my life's work now because um, I still write a, uh, a book every – well, I ghostwrite quite a bit to pay for it. Uh, but I basically um, – just work on this show and try to um, continue to do what COVID robbed everybody of, which was also getting these in class uh, interviews and in depth with these authors. And we really get into the weeds, you know? So I just uh, am grateful for it and glad that the opportunity continues to present itself. I'm getting to some of these names. We have a science fiction edition coming up, uh, which interviews many of the great science fiction authors Um but the show's guests, um, okay, here we are. Are you with me? I'm here. Okay, I'm going to read some of these off to you because if I try to do them from memory, I'll, I'll just, I'm 46 and feeling seen out from my schedule. Uh, so there's Joyce Carol Oates, Martian uh, movie writer Andy Weir, Lincoln Rhyme creator Jeffrey Deaver, Barry Eisler, uh, James Rollins, J.A. Jantz, uh, Dr. Rice, Rocket Boys author Homer Hickam, Sarah Paretsky, Rambo creator, um, uh, uh, there's the True Blood creator, Charlene Harris, uh, David Morrell, Rambo creator, Joe R. Lansdale, um, Donnie Brasco. Remember Joe Pistone that, that uh, Johnny Depp played in the movie? We have the real FBI agent. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Dean yeah, Coons. yeah. Yeah, Dean Coons. Um, it just goes on. It's an amazing list. Jay McInerney that wrote Bright Lights, Big City. Ben Mesrick that wrote The Social Network. Um, and uh, basically the idea um, was to try to, and from seasons one and two, real quick, there's like Karen Slaughter, T.C. Boyle, Brad Meltzer, Ian Rankin, Catherine Coulter, Heather Graham, uh, John Lesquois, Tess Gerritsen, F. Lee Bailey in his final filmed interview before he died, oh, um, wow. Mindhunter, John Douglas, the FBI profiling legend, uh, Steve Alton that did The Meg, Rob Bell. Uh, upcoming here in seasons five and six, we have David Baldacci, Gillian Flynn, Patricia Cornwell, um, just amazing names. W. Bruce Cameron that does the Dog's Purpose books, Lemony Snicket. Um, I'm just kind of pulling randomly from that list. Uh, so hopefully Beverly D'Onofrio, who wrote uh, Riding in Cars with Boys. Um, there's, just, there's just on and on and on. There's just an amazing cast. And the whole point is to try to get into the weeds um, in a sort of episodic way so you can kind of really, really discover an artist's catalog, an author's catalog from you know, book one all the way up to the present. And in many cases, we're talking to authors with 60-year-old catalogs. In some cases, they're just starting. In a lot of cases, they've been around and uh, maybe you're just coming up with something new. But we do about 10 a week uh, filmed. And then the seasons are just, we have a horror edition coming up, a United Kingdom edition. So there's tons and tons. I could come back on and tell you in greater length on the TV version, of uh, the film version about it. But uh, it has become my life's work and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Well, that's great. It's nice to hear. Some of those names I've were overlapping that have actually, they've been on my show. You mentioned yeah, Steve Alton yeah. and David Baldacci. They've been on. One yeah. of the questions, though, that I have for you is a little more on a technical side. It, it says, sure. first of its kind, streaming television show. So you're doing this live? No, no, no. Streaming meaning the streaming format. So like streamed, like uh, with an example of Pluto or Netflix or any of the stream content uh, channels. Um, and once once these go up, they stay up. I mean, the two B seasons have been on a couple years now, and the other one, the others that'll go up stay. But no, so if you're sitting at home on a Friday night and you're a book nerd and or just a fan of a certain author, so to speak, you love hearing about writing, or you're an aspiring author and you're trying to look for a little, you know, extra guidance, kind of like y'all do on the live uh, format and 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 you know with your show. What we're doing on ours is a little bit more kind of, um, I guess you would put it in the context of like like one of the books I'm writing where you're taking, it's a story. I mean, we're talking like it's really telling the story of their entire career. And in some cases, you know, um, trying to get as much advice out of it as like everyone is in terms of the aspiring author, you know, from front to back on the process, because a, a lot of these authors, uh, myself included before COVID would be going to classrooms or would be, you know, doing some element of, of interfacing with the next generation of writers. And, you know, thank God for these technologies that we've got Skype, Zoom and so forth to continue doing it. But um, yeah, we're just trying to kind of exist in our little space and, um, keep doing it, man. We have a YouTube channel as well that, that uh, does uh, its great amount of traffic we're grateful for, and we keep adding to it every day, new promos, new episodes, early premieres, um, extended previews. So, yeah, 
just glad to be in the 2020s and didn't have COVID behind us like I'm sure you guys are, you know? Oh, definitely. What's your YouTube channel? What's the name of it? It's about the Authors TV. Oh, okay. Look it up on YouTube. All right. Yeah. No, I mean, we're on Twitter. We did, when I first started my uh, video edition show, we went to a distributor who promised us 110 channel distribution. Uh, most of the channels I'd never heard of, but there were a couple, um, uh, Hulu was one, and Apple TV was another, Roku was another one, you know, and the rest of them I'd never heard of. So we said, okay. And we did that. And the show went out to all these different channels. And, you know, we got like 10 views on each channel. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. Why don't we just corral everybody into YouTube? Because, number one, it's free, and it's, you know, mm -hmm. probably the largest platform. And By far. Yeah, by far. I mean, there's, what, over 20 million channels on YouTube, something like that. And, yeah. you know, then all of a sudden, now we're getting hundreds, now we're thousands. You know, our, our channel is almost to a million. Uh, not each view, but, you know, total for all the oh, shows. Yeah. And, you know, I thought, well, okay, that was much better. And, you know, we saved ourselves 200 bucks a month. So I'm just trying to decide what's the difference between streaming television and YouTube if it's not live. Well, there, there probably isn't a difference. On, it's probably a, a, a distinction without a difference, right? A difference without a, you know, without an expression. Okay. Because yeah. it's a matter of preference for a lot of people, I would guess. Um, one of the things, for instance, that uh, that YouTube does that and Tubi does, um, if you pay for these closed captions, which we do for the for each episode on, on the, the streaming network, is um, you can watch it anywhere and it'll translate it, I believe, in most of those languages. Oh, into, so, okay. You, yeah, YouTube yeah. has closed captions also, though, that does that. So, yeah, those are the two places to be, man, and that's where there's so much exciting new things going on. Uh, and so we're really just happy to have an imprint in both. And, you know, Teddy Riley's book is uh, coming up. Um, Corrupt's book I've been working on with him for a couple years now, the Dogtown uh, rapper. Um, there's a Nashville songwriter, three and four, at some point that'll be uh, seeing the light of day. And a couple other things on the book side, uh, for sure, that are still in the fire. But this is, is definitely my primary uh, uh, I don't like the word passion because I think it's so overused, but it's definitely my primary <laughs> driver right now. You're right. It is overused. I mean, they call it, you know, passion fruit ice cream. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I get a funny quick anecdote if you got 30 seconds. Well, we got 30 seconds. I was going to say we got about two minutes, but go ahead. Yeah. If you remember the Arsenio Hall show, so I'm 46. So I grew up in the 80s and early 90s. And I'll never forget Brian Bosworth, who, who was a kind of played football for one season and got injured and got like 11 million bucks in the, in the, the buyout. So he didn't have to work. So he put, he became an actor and he went on Arsenio Hall and he said, you know, Arsenio, I got a passion for acting. I'm passionate. You know, I feel <laughs> passionate about it. I'm really impassioned about oh, yeah. my passion. For, oh, and it was like, bro, you're killing the word for the, <laughs> the future. Anyway, I, so I, I always when I use the word passion, I think of Brian Bosworth on the on the Arsenio Hall show saying it. Well, that's a good um, connection, and it, it's suitable because that's exactly right. You're, he's killing yeah, the word, but it's not to take away yeah. yeah from the legitimacy of of having a passion. That's wonderful. There's just hopefully though pop culture will present us other words within which to articulate that. <laughs> well, exactly, and if you overuse the word, it dilutes the meaning and the significance. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, let me yeah. just, we just got about a minute, Jake. I just wanted to ask you quick about sure. your music's greatest mysteries on AXS TV. Uh, what is that Axis. one? Oh, yeah. Axis. Axis. Okay. Uh, Axis is a great network. It's on, uh, well, we're, we have Uverse, so you can get it on Uverse. I don't know that Comcast carries it. Uh, yeah, it was an Emmy nom It was nominated for an Emmy last year. It was just kind of like dropped out of the sky in good fortune. Um, and basically, because I've written, I guess it's I'm 55 books now, it's kind of, uh, I'm lucky that I've got a little bit of a, of a I hate to use the word historian, because there's really people that are rock historians. I'm just, it, I, I, I have a lot of knowledge from writing a lot of these books and, and so forth. And so me with a lot of other really interesting, much more interesting than I, music personalities, uh, and, and, and just people that I guess they bring on to talk about different things that are solved and unsolved within music's greatest mysteries. So, for instance, it could be Bon Scott's death, and they arranged it all the way. I, one of the segments I did was on Eminem and Trump uh, calling the Secret Service to come over to Eminem because he said something in one of his songs about Ivanka being in his trunk. You know, another one was about, yeah, another one was about Jimi Hendrix to some, on some connection. Another one was about Jim Morrison 
uh, I, I don't know. It's just really cool. You know, they, they just have you, they throw a bunch of topics at you and you just kind of give them a little bit of your, your sort of feedback and opinion. And you just keep your fingers crossed that they use you. And the great thing about it is they run that show all summer. It's like, you, you know, whether you're, whether you, whether even if I was a current or past cast member, I just, you smile because you're so lucky because here you're on randomly, like on a Tuesday night at 11 a.m., 11 p.m., or you might then be on at 3 a.m. on a Friday, or you might be on at whatever the prime time before the new episode. So it's, it's just a fortunate thing that uh, I'm grateful to be involved with. Well, that's fantastic. Jake, we do have to wind this down. It was nice talking to you. I wish we could go on, but uh, you know how, we, how busy everyone is. Um, yes, sir. Congratulations you, on all your, your show's success, too. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, do you have a yeah. website you want to give out, like an all-encompassing one, or do you have 50 uh, small just, ones? <laughs> yeah, the, the YouTube channel for is about the author's TV. You can okay. search it on uh, on Google, and it pulls up right there for Tubi or go to Tubi itself uh, on your Snort TV. Jake Brown Books is my website, but I'm primarily uh, through the show. And um, we're on Twitter at About Authors TV. Um, Facebook is usually pretty you know, uh, is what it is these days. But we also have an Instagram page uh, that gets much more traffic on Facebook uh, in terms of what we put up. But the Twitter channel is really, I got to say, since kind of the election got over, um, Twitter really just opened up into like a whole new, you know, thing. You know what I mean? So there, it's just a whole new community and it doesn't have the political toxicity that it did. Um, well, I'm happy to hear a lot that. of things. This Elon Musk thing might have changed that a little, but in general, for the last couple of years, it's been a wonderfully organic place to grow a new thing, uh, and and we we just really love engaging there because it, it, it's where so many authors are plugged right into their you know their readers. Okay. Um, well, listen. Thanks so much so for again. coming on. It was great meeting up with you again. And all right, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right, take care, Jake. Bye bye. Take care, buddy. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers. Don't touch anything. You've got it right where you need it. Tuned in to the Douglas Coleman Show. You heard me. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Peter Ponza. Hi, Peter. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you for coming on the show. It's nice to have you here. So I'm looking at your bio. It says that you operate a dental supply business. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. We did that for 22 years. Yeah, I sold it 22, uh, I had it 22 years, I sold it 10 years ago, and that's when I started writing. Okay. What inspired you to start writing? Was it something in the business or something outside of it? 
Well, actually, you know, I did get started in the dental supply business. We um, wanted to get marketing. I started my own newsletter to be able to reach our customers. And then a friend of mine who was also in the uh, gentle journal business um, wanted us to advertise, which we did. And he said, by the way, you're a technician. Why don't you write some articles for us? I said, terrific. Glad to do that, which we did. And um, I, I, I was doing that for quite a while. And finally, when we sold the business, um, the same day I sold it, there was a, a workshop at the uh, Orange Hill Library, and uh, I said, I'm going. And my wife said, are, are you really wanting to do that? You just sold your business, and now you want to do that? I said, yeah. So I, I did a workshop, and uh, that's uh, when I started writing a little bit uh, more seriously and got away from the uh, clinical stuff, the dental stuff. And uh, I've been having a great time doing it. Um, hone my hone my skills a little bit better with uh, a course I took at uh, University of Waterloo, and um, then I decided to re- write a little bit uh, before that. And then, of course, COVID started, and of course, we didn't have much choice but being at home. So I was sat at home and started writing until I finished this novel. So yeah, it's been it's been fun. There's nothing on your bio about the novel. All I have is a photo of the uh, book cover. But it's called Outfoxed, an Inspector William Fox adventure. Is this a series? I'm planning on doing a series, yes. I've just had a, a wonderful review by Grady Harp on Goodreads. He likes it. He gave me a five-star review. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about the story. Um, yeah. uh, my um, protagonist is the, uh, William Fox. He's an RCMP officer. And he likes to go off script a little bit. And he's chasing gang- gangsters on the St. Lawrence River. And when that's uh, kind of put behind him, he ends up getting involved with the FBI. A fellow named uh, Patrick Riley, and uh, they have a, a big chase across the world looking for uh, his, um, let's see, it's uh, William Fox's old girlfriend. And she's been kidnapped by the triad because she's been looking for some uh, 15th century Asian artifacts and the it, the chase takes them all over from Hong Kong to New York to uh, Newfoundland and back into Canada and uh, it's quite a chase and uh, I've tried to build a, a lot of uh, suspense and in, into it and it's a uh, it's a um, quite an interesting story uh, like I uh, we've been calling it a, a slick globe trotting adventure that involves you know both the RCMP and FBI my idea my idea was behind it was basically to Join both the American um, uh, forces, uh, police forces, and the Canadian police forces as a as a symbiotic group that goes out and, and does something together. You know, kind of unifying uh, the police forces and uh, fighting crime against the the uh, the bad guys over there in Asia. It was kind of an interesting concept that I was trying to trying to get across. And uh, so far, it seems to work. I've had a few people who really like the idea. And uh, I'm working on my next one, which is going to be a little bit different, but pretty close along the same similar I- idea. Um, it'll be also in Asia, but it'll be another country, another totalitarian government with a little bit more, um, hopefully, uh, gun shooting and action and all that sort of stuff that makes a good thriller. It sounds sort of James Bondish. Is it like that? I've been told that's what it's been like, yes. Okay. So this is the first book. <laughs> Outfoxed, uh, and then you were talking about another book. It's going to be the same character, the William Fox Inspector? Yes, we'll be bringing back William Fox, and perhaps I'll be bringing back uh, a few other uh, people, like Tracy Jordan, who was uh, who was our uh, girlfriend of uh, Fox's, and perhaps we'll also be bringing back um, Patrick Riley and a few others. Um, I'm just juggling a whole bunch of different characters, so I'm looking, searching for names here because uh, uh, there's a, a number of different ideas I'm, I'm still working on. I've only done about three chapters of the, of the second novel, and I'm still wondering who I'll be bringing back. But I think it'll, uh, I may be bringing back some more of the American content, and I, primarily that's what I, I've been thinking about doing now. Okay. But it's still in the early stages, so I don't want to give away too much. But so this obviously has nothing to do with dental supplies, right? <laughs> Far from it. Very far from it. Yeah, I took a big leap away from that, and uh, it's been like ten years since I've been all, anywhere near that business whatsoever. But it was a successful business, and we enjoyed it, and it, it uh, gave me the opportunity to be able to retire and do what I'm doing now. So. Was there any one particular thing that sort of sparked the idea for this? Something that happened in your life, maybe? Uh, you have to say, 
Yes, it, yes, it did. Uh, there was a gentleman who um, introduced me to a book called um, 1421, and it, it had to do with um, Admiral Zhang He, who was the um, an admiral who was who was sailing in the 15th century around the world. Now, he's a famous um, Chinese admiral. He had a treasure fleet, and uh, it's been known that he's been going through quite a different uh, areas through Australia and through. Um, uh, India and all these areas to the uh, Asian Pacific. Uh, and that's that's uh, pretty well um, written history. Now, what I did was I elaborated a little bit and uh, I took his story and I extrapolated and put in a, a little bit of my characters and I took the treasure and I left it in Nova Scotia in Canada. And so that's the focal po- point. But to get back to the gentleman, the, uh, he loaned me, he gave me this book. We had a great discussion. Uh, one of those evenings where we, we were enjoying some good scotch, and we used to call uh, all of the things that came out of that scotch wisdom because uh, we were rather focused on what we were talking about. And, he, and his book was really one of the best things that he gave me. Um, Gavin Manzas was the one who wrote it, and Gavin was uh, a, a, a United Kingdom commander of a submarine, and he's been around the world, and he put, uh, put together all of this um, information about the Admiral Zheng He, and I found it very fascinating that he'd gone to all this trouble to to write this book. And so that was my inspiration. And I also give credit to the gentleman who gave me that book. Uh, I give him an acknowledgement in my book. And um, it's it's actually quite a quite an interesting story. I recommend people to read it. It's um, I think one of those stories that maybe takes into consideration that maybe the Chinese were already sailing the world before Christopher Columbus and, and major major numbers as well. So some reading, some very interesting reading for some people who are, are not uh, who are not too uh, keen on the, the regular history and want something a little bit different. Okay, I want to shift over to the your publishing process. When you finished your book, did you have connections in publishing or did you self-publish it or how is it published at this I point? I had no connections. Yeah, I... Um, Okay, that, this is a, an interesting situation because I didn't want to spend a lot of time with this manuscript, sending it to different publishers. Um, I didn't want to spend years being rejected, so I decided I would just go with a company that did that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, it's called Friesen Press, and they're out of Canada, and they do, you know, for a certain fee, they'll, they'll publish your book for you, which is what I had done. So I'm, I'm self-published. You're sort of hybrid published because self-published means you take your your story and you go to the app that's on Kindle and you format it and then you stick it up on Amazon yourself. That would be self-published. Paying someone else to publish the book is a sort of a hybrid publishing. Okay, I'll accept that. Um, there's there's basically three different <laughs> routes that authors can go th- these days. Traditional publishing, which is like you said, you send it around. And if they like it, they'll take it. If they don't, they send you a nice letter. And then there's the hybrid, which is sort of you pay them for their services to publish your book. And then the third is self-published, which is what I explained. So, okay. Well, that's all right. And the book is out now? It's been released? It's out now, yes. How long has it been out? It's been released. It's on all of the... uh, It came out at the end of February. So it's on Amazon and Apple and... uh, Kindle and all the rest of them. So should be able to get it without any issues. Okay. Um, you getting any reviews? Anything good? I did get one, as a matter of fact. I got some uh, reviews. I got one from uh, Grady Harp on Goodreads, and he gave me a, a five stars, which uh, is okay. I think I'm happy with that. Uh, and then I've had a few uh, people who have read it and have sent me emails saying that uh, they enjoyed the book. So... It's on its way. I mean, it's still in early stages, and uh, I'm pleased to see that people are reading it. I mean, it was supposed to be just basically a hobby for me to do something after after my career. But um, now that I'm seeing some results, I'm, th- I'm feeling comfortable that perhaps maybe I should move on to the next level and see where the second novel will take me. I may, I may be looking for more traditional publishing uh, in, on the second book. How long did it take you to write this one, from the time you sort of had the ideas to when it was finished? Well, it was a long process because I started, and it took me a couple of years uh, for the first part, and then it, there was a hi- hiatus because I wasn't quite sure whether I had to, together to do it. So during that time, I took the course at the University of Waterloo to kind of hone my craft a little bit better. 
then of course the um, two years of uh, COVID. So I would say about four and a half to five years, perhaps for this first first one. But I think I can probably do the next one in less than a year. Now that I know what I've gone through, I mean the process was really um, very interesting with the editing and all the things we had to do to get it done. And with all that, of course, behind you, you know, well, you really learn a lot during the first one. All all the mistakes you've made and all the the things you could have changed afterwards. But the editing process seems to me the, the most complex and uh, the most um, revealing on where your issues are. So the next time you come around, it should be a little bit better, I would think. Um, one quick thing. On your bio, it says that you spent two seasons racing with the Jagged Edgers Motorsports. So are you a race car driver? Well, we did. We did, yeah. You that did. started uh, okay. with the... Uh, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. yeah we, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this group called Chump Car. No. Um, they're... Uh, they were, they they started a number of years ago where you would be able to get a car, and they, what they wanted to do was get people like regular folks um, be able to race. So you'd be uh, buying a car for under five hundred dollars, and they would scrutinize that, minus the um, safety equipment. You know all the other things you had to do in it to make it safe with the roll car cage and whatnot. And then we would race it. Um, we had two cars at one point. How we started uh, was that we were in the Jaguar Club, and the Jaguar Club. Uh, through North America had a what they call a slalom run, and it was a, a format we used to run to almost every club in North America. And we were all getting good in, in Ontario, and the fellow said, well, you know what, why don't we take this another notch? And so we got involved with Chump, and we bought a car, and we started uh, working on it. So we had two seasons running. I did before I, I decided that that was enough for me. Um, it's an expensive port, sport to begin with, but uh, it can be quite dangerous too. So I had a kind of revelation on the back the back 150 feet or something i just said that's it a little too scary for me and i decided that i've kept like the in my career in that regard <laughs> but we had a lot of fun with it and it was a, a real adrenaline rush you never had I, any um, accidents no i know i never had one no um but uh not i don't think any of my team ever had an accident uh, i mean one of the one of the guys dented my front end fender and one of the corners he he came in and crossed, crossed me out right, right on what they call the, the chicane, which is the corner where they, uh, he cut right through me. And he, I, I told uh, my manager, like, he, he dented me, should we make a complaint? He said, nah, don't bother, this is supposed to be fun. I said, okay, so we just let it go. But no, I did end up with a flat tire once, which was um, kind of interesting because I had to wait in the car. I couldn't get out. It was a five-point harness. I was stuck in there. It was really hot with the, the Nomax fire suit on and everything. But, they hauled me around the track, and we came back, and I was just waiting for the guys to jack up the car and put the tire on it. And then my manager comes running over, peeks in the. He says it counts as a, as a it, it counts as a, a, a once around the track. I said, oh, isn't that interesting? Because they counted the the, uh, the track at times every time we went around it, it. It was a bonus. So uh, he was kind of pleased about that. And I was like, okay, whatever you want. <laughs> interesting <laughs> afternoon, though. We do have to wind this yeah. down. Thank you so much for coming on. Okay. Uh, my guest is Peter Ponza. The book is called Outfoxed, an Inspector William Fox Adventure. It is out now. Do you have a website that you want to give out? Sure. It's Peter Ponza, or pardon me, PeterThomasPonza.com. Okay. And there's information about the book and links, and if people want to buy it, they can buy it through your website? That's correct. It's all there. All right. Very good. Well, thank you for coming on and sharing your story. It was nice to meet you, and best of luck with the book. I hope it does well. Okay, thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it, and it was fun speaking with you. 